I have noticed that there is a love affair between modern evangelicals and ancient heresies. What's up, guys? Welcome back to Kingdom Craft, where I build this big church in Minecraft while I talk about Christian theology. And today, I'm going to be talking about a specific aspect of Christian theology that has historically been very important to the church, but has largely been thrown in the garbage by modern evangelicals. And that, of course, is the Blessed Virgin Mary. So, the biggest problem, perhaps, in Protestantism is when we try and sound as un-Catholic as possible. Because, obviously, Catholics have elevated Mary in their theology perhaps more than they should, but as a reaction to that, many Protestants have turned Mary into just this pragmatic tool whose only use was to bear the physical body of Jesus, and that's it. So, and there were even some like radical Anabaptists during the Reformation who said that Jesus wasn't even biologically descended from Mary, that he was just some other um, human that was just planted in Mary's womb, but wasn't actually descended from her at all. And of course that's contradictory to what um, the church has historically taught, and kind of like the Bible even, because it says Jesus is descended from David, and if Joseph is not his biological father, then Mary must be his biological mother. And I know most people today don't believe that, so that's not really what I'm going to argue against. What people do tend to argue against in the evangelical Protestant world is the historic title for Mary, Mother of God. So Catholics call Mary the Mother of God, but they're not the only ones who do that. So do the Eastern Orthodox, Lutheran, Anglican, and I think the majority of historic Presbyterians, although there has been some debate in the Reformed tradition, but um, I'm going to go over a brief history of where that term comes from. So yeah, like I said, we should not be trying to sound as un-Catholic as possible. Just because the Catholics are wrong about something doesn't mean we need to swing in the exact opposite direction. I think most of the problems in Protestantism come from that very impulse that many of us in the Protestant, um, in the Protestant world have had. So, uh, what do we believe about Mary? So, it's not so much that Mary should be the center of our thinking. Of course, Jesus is the center of our thinking. But what we say about Mary influences what we say about Jesus. So, if people say Mary is not the mother of God, well, what are they saying about Jesus then? That's a real thing. That is why the church insisted on using the term Theotokos, which means mother of God or God-bearer or whatever. Um, so yeah, it all goes down to, uh, comes down to this controversy that happened in the first few centuries of the church with uh, this group of people called the Nestorians. And the Nestorians rejected the term Mother of God for Mary. And their view of Jesus was that not only did Jesus have two natures, he was kind of like two persons in one. So they really separated Jesus' humanity from Jesus' divinity into like two different persons. And that's why they said Mary's the Mother of Christ, but not the Mother of God. But um, their reasoning for that was because if Christ is, if, or if like there's one person that's uh, Jesus Christ and another person that's God the Son, and these two persons are like connected but they're not the same exact person, then it, with their logic, it is appropriate to say, oh yeah, Mary's not the mother of God, she's just the mother of Christ. And there's some evangelicals today who I talk to, um, not this very day, but I, like in the past few days when I've talked about this, who say that even the term mother of Christ is too high of a term for Mary. She's just the mother of Jesus' humanity. So most evangelicals will not say that Jesus is two persons. But what they will say is, oh, um, Mary just gave birth to Jesus' humanity. But do, you, do people give birth to natures or do they give birth to persons? So yeah, Mary didn't give birth to a human nature. She gave birth to a person. That person was Jesus, and Jesus has two natures, a human nature and a divine nature. So because of that, it is right to call Mary the mother of God. So 
obviously the objection to that is, well, it sounds like you're saying that Mary existed before God if she's the mother of God, but no one thinks that. Even the Catholics don't think Mary pre-existed God, but because Mary is the woman by whom God entered our universe physically and became incarnate in our universe, took on human flesh, it's right to call her the mother of God. So, now, why am I getting so, you know, wrapped up in this? Why does it matter what we say about Mary? Why does Mary's title matter? Because what we say about Mary affects what we say about Christ. So, um, I know that people who don't use the term mother of God are not literally Nestorians, but the way they see the, uh, the person of Christ is influenced by Nestorianism. So, we need to understand the hypostatic union. The hypostatic union is the theological term for the way that Jesus' humanity and Jesus' divinity are united. So, hypostasis means person in Greek. So, the hypostatic union means that Jesus' humanity and divinity are united in one person. So, Jesus has two natures, but Jesus is one person. These two natures are hypostatically united to one another. So, that's without explaining what that means, then we're just throwing out a bunch of word salad here. So, we do need to explain what it means that Jesus' two natures are hypostatically united. What that means, really, is that the personal names for Jesus are interchangeable. So, if you're using God, Christ, and Jesus as personal names, they're interchangeable. So, it's also right to say that God died on the cross. What we are saying is not that the being of God stopped existing when Jesus died on the cross. That's not what we're saying. So, if you're talking about God in terms of the divine essence, or the divine being, no, God did not die on the cross. But if you're talking about God as a personal title, which can be applied to Jesus, then yes, God did die on the cross. It's the same with Mary. So, um, did Mary create the divine essence? No, we're not saying that. No one's saying that, not even the Catholics. And we're not Catholic. I'm not. Um, what we are saying is that since God is a personal title for Jesus, it is right to say that Mary is the mother of God. That's the way the hypostatic union works. The personal terms for Jesus are interchangeable. So these terms are the Son of God, God the Son, Christ the Messiah, all, all, these, all these personal names and personal titles, names and words that are associated with the person of Christ, not the natures of Christ, those can be used interchangeably. That is that's the meaning of the hypostatic union, the personal union. So yeah, Nestorianism it's, there's some debate over whether Nestorius himself was a Nestorian, because, of course, church history is written by the victors. So, in every heresy, every heretic that we read about in church history is, like, somewhat strawmanned. So, there's also a debate over whether Pelagius was really a Pelagian. Pelagius was supposedly the guy who said that man is not dead in sin and can earn his own salvation, earn his way into heaven. And now there's some people who are saying, no, that's just a caricature of him. He didn't actually say that. And some people are saying similar things about Nestorius. But what is true, what we do know for a fact, is Nestorius did um, reject the title Theotokos, or Mother of God, for Mary. Now, even if it is a straw man that Nestorius believed Jesus was two persons, which maybe it's not. We, we really don't know for sure, because we don't have any writings of him. We can't, like, interview him. There are no old tweets we can resurface of his uh, from 2009 or whatever. We can't do that. He lived, um, like, 1800 hundred years, 1800 years ago or something. So all we have to go are the writings of... All we have to go by are the writings of his critics. But we do know that he really separated Jesus' humanity and his divinity a lot more than he was supposed to because um, that's not something we should do, because we must understand that Jesus' humanity and divinity are united in one person. Now, there is an opposite heresy from Nestorianism, which is, of course, monophysitism. So we say Jesus is 
one person but two natures. And um, Nestorius was saying he's kind of like two persons, two natures, if he really said that, and that's another thing. Um, but monophysitism is the opposite heresy, which says Jesus has only one nature. Now, there are different variations of monophysitism. There's a kind of acceptable version called miaphysitism, which says Jesus has one nature, but that one nature is a union of two natures, and that's held by some churches today, the Oriental Orthodox churches, so I, I wouldn't say they're heretics, but Miaphysitism is, in my opinion, a heresy that's modified enough that it's not a heresy, but still kind of sketchy. Um, but that's the topic for another day. Today I'm talking about Nestorianism, which is the opposite heresy. So when I say evangelicals have a love affair with ancient heresies, it's because evangelicals are usually not rooted in church tradition. They um, have th this idea that's called Biblicism, that not only is the Bible the only infallible authority on faith, and that's what all Protestants believe, that's just standard sola scriptura, but sola scriptura is not the same as Biblicism. Biblicism is all we need is the Bible. We don't need philosophy, we don't need church history, we don't need any of that. And that is not what the Protestant reformers intended. That's not what Luther and Calvin intended. Luther was the one who thought of the doctrine of sola scriptura, but he himself had a very high view of church history. And he criticized the Catholics in many ways for not following the church history they claimed to carry on the torch of. So yeah, there's a, there's a very, very big difference between um, sola scriptura in its classical understanding and biblicism. So biblicism, which most evangelicals hold to, kind of has this aversion to church history. And when you don't study church history, you'll be susceptible to the same exact ancient heresies that the early church dealt with, and that includes Nestorianism. So if you study church history, you'll understand why it's important that we call Mary the mother of God, and not just the mother of Christ, or just the mother of Jesus. You'll, you'll understand why we, we shouldn't be doing that. But if you don't study church history, and you just follow you know your own personal interpretation of the Bible, you'll end up falling into a lot of the same heresies that... Um, people in the early church did. Another um, heresy that's popular among evangelicals, it's not a damning heresy, but I think it's still a heresy, is social Trinitarianism, and a variant of that is eternal functional subordinationism, or just EFS or subordinationism. Basically, and there's a good chance that this is what you think, it's okay, I used to think it too, Social Trinitarianism is the idea that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit each have their own distinct will. So God has three wills, not one. And this is an example of why Biblicism isn't as good as it sounds. It sounds great to say, like, yo, we just believe the Bible. We believe the Bible and nothing else. But if you say that and you ignore church history and philosophy, what you're really doing is you're just interpreting the Bible with your own cultural presuppositions and not taking into account other um, cultural um, understanding, and understandings of the Bible. So this use of church history and philosophy is to try and not be blinded by our own cultural presuppositions, which we have a tendency to do. So, uh, by the way, I'm making stained glass for some of the windows in the church right now. Um, so that's, that's the reason that um, it's important to study church history to avoid a lot of the heresies. So the fact that a lot of American evangelicals support social Trinitarianism, the idea that God has three wills and not one, is uh, really shows um, why Biblicism fails, because it's a result of them being influenced by their cultural presuppositions. It's a very Western American cultural thing to say that each person must have their own will. The definition of a person means that person has their own will. Um, because, you know, we're Americans, we're individualists, we're, you know, free thinkers. Um, but that's not a universal idea. That's more of a, a Western individualist and especially American idea that we can't even imagine personhood and will, like, not being interchangeable, not um, going along with each other. So that's why our assumption is that if God is three persons, then God must have three wills. But that's not the case. God has one will. Um, historically, will has been understood to go along with essence. So, um, just the way God has one will and not three, the Sixth Ecumenical Council stated that Jesus has two wills and not one. It 
um, the Sixth Ecumenical Council, I believe, condemned monothelitism, which is mono means one and thel theletis or something means will. Uh, so um, it's it condemned the idea that Jesus has one will and instead that Jesus has two. So yeah, that's just another one of many examples of how, you know, we need church history in order to interpret the Bible. Not that church history is authoritative on par with scripture in and of itself, but without it, we will be susceptible to a lot of errors due to our own cultural presuppositions. And um, we need to rely on the wisdom of those who've come before us. That's just common sense. So, yeah, that is why um, it's important for us to say that Mary is indeed the mother of God. So this is a pretty short video. I just wanted to clarify this because I did a poll on Instagram, uh, all my followers, and it was pretty 50-50. Then after I explained um, why the church has historically called Mary the mother of God, it was more like 80-20 in favor of Mary being called the mother of God. And um, maybe they're just being nice to me, humoring me. But I, I hope that if before this video you were skeptical of that term, I hope you can see why it's important now. Because Jesus is one person, not two. Mary gave birth to a person, not a nature. That person is truly God. Jesus is God. Mary gave birth to Jesus. Mary's the mother of Jesus. Therefore, Mary is the mother of God.